Our mailbox flag is still down, so we are still waiting for some viewer mail. Please send us your comments or questions, and we will share them on the show. You can write mail and give it to your friendly TAP activities person, or you can call us and leave a message by dialing the number 2813. A little later, we will be talking to Maria Scholz, the Director of Admissions. Now for a message from Rabbi Hirschhorn and Rabbi Noah. Today is the first day of the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. This is the Feast of Weeks, also known as the holiday of receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. And it begins Thursday evening at May 28th and continues through Saturday, May 30th. And just like the Pentecost falls 50 days after Easter, Shavuot comes seven weeks after Passover. It is the Jewish holiday that celebrates both the harvest season in Israel, as well as the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Shavuot, which means weeks in Hebrew, refers to the timing of the festival. It is also known as the day of the first fruits, because it is the time the farmers of Israel would bring their first harvest to Jerusalem as a token of thanksgiving. We want to wish a good yontiv and a hag sameach, or in English, happy holiday to all those who celebrate. We have a great show planned for you today, so let's get into the news. Let's take a look at the weather in our neck of the woods. Today there will be scattered thunderstorms developing during the afternoon with a high of 78 degrees. Saturday we will have rain showers early with some sunshine later in the day. Thunder is possible with a high of 83 degrees. Sunday will be mainly sunny with a high of 71 degrees. So hope we get some more sun this weekend um, and so that we can enjoy some less rainy days. Let's move to this day in history. May 29th, 1942, Bing Crosby, we all know Bing Crosby, records the world's top selling record White Christmas for the soundtrack of the film Holiday Inn. This day in history, 1943, the Million Dollar Band was heard for the first time on NBC radio. This day in history, 1960, Sophia Loren has called in the Scotland Yard after a million dollars of jewels had been stolen, which included diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. She was in England shooting the film version of George Bernard Shaw's The Millionaires. And also this day in history, still pertaining to jewels, I think I have a theme today. A rare pink diamond was sold at Christie's in Hong Kong after six minutes of bidding for $17.4 million. The diamond was the biggest of its type to ever be sold and was bought by an anonymous bidder. The 12 carat diamond was cut in 1976 by the US jeweler, Harry Winston, and was named <clears throat> Martian Pink after the Mars landing. Hold on everybody, having teleprompter issues. Our famous birthday for today is John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He was born May 29, 1917, in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was our president. John F. Kennedy came from a well-connected political family. He was a World War II hero who later served as a U.S. representative and a U.S. senator for the state of Massachusetts. 
He was elected as the U.S. President in 1960 and was the youngest person elected to that position. He served from 1961 to 1963 until his assassination by Lee Harvey Oswald. During his short time as president, Kennedy's administration grappled with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, and the Civil Rights Movement. Here is a quote from JFK. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest form of appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Celebrating some birthdays here at the home today, we have Jeanette R. Um, these are nothing for today, but these are weekend birthdays. So for May 30th, we have Jeanette R., Eva B., Seema F., James H., and for the 31st, we have Angel T., Ann M., James B., and Blanca P. Happy birthday to everyone this week weekend. We wish you all the best. Also happening today, let's see what food services is cooking up for us. Today's lunch will be cheese pizza and a Caesar salad with peaches for dessert. And for dinner, we have vegetable soup, Swiss steak with onion gravy, herb potato kugel, and chocolate cake for dessert. Saturday's lunch will be beer battered baked fish, sweet potato, and parsley cauliflower with sponge cake for dessert. Dinner will be cream of soup broccoli, California vegetable sandwich, and potato chips with strawberry ice cream for dessert. Saturday's lunch will be southern fried chicken, seasoned diced potatoes, and collard greens with a fudge cookie for dessert. And get ready for the hardest soup pronounced. Dinner will be stracciatella. Did I say it right, guys? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, broiled salmon, orzo with mushrooms, and fruit cocktail for dessert. Our guest for today is Maria Schulz, the Director of Admissions. So please help me welcome Maria. Thank you, Olivia. I'm happy to be here with you today on this Friday morning. Thank you for joining us. So I do this with everybody. I ask everyone, tell me a little bit. I know we have so many hats that we wear here, but tell me a little bit about what your role is here. So I'm the Director of Admissions, and my team's primary purpose is to welcome families, visitors, and potential residents to the Hebrew home. We share the extensive history of our home. We provide tours. We focus on um, our rehabilitative services, which are so strong here, as well as many of the other amenities that we have. But I think one of the primary things that we do is that we help families navigate what can be a sometimes difficult situation. It, it's never easy when you're making the decision to put your loved one into a facility, even a facility as wonderful and beautiful as ours. You know, they're looking, we come here to work. These people are looking for a home for their family member. And oftentimes the family members are, are very, very ill and have other issues that they're dealing with, such as memory issues and dementia, and they're requiring of special services that the family can no longer provide at home. And oftentimes there's a lot of guilt associated with that. So I think one of the most important things that we do is we really reassure and help these families through challenging times and there have been numerous occasions where we've gotten notes and calls after the process is over saying thank you for making it so much easier for us thank you for being there when we had a million questions thank you for watching us and holding our hand while we cried because it can be a very stressful time yeah. on the short-term admission side what we do is we work with our referral sources social workers discharge planners at the various hospitals throughout the new york state new jersey metropolitan area mm -hmm and we bring in residents for short-term rehab. Those are more functional type of admissions. It's a rather cut and dry process, whereas the long-term admissions are much more extensive right. and lengthy. Right, so yeah, it, I think, you know, thinking of admissions, you think of just kind of getting a chart and filling a bed with a person, yeah. but there sounds like there's so much more of this relationship that's created and 
Um, I know from within my department, we help a lot with the transition as many other people, departments do here once they're here. But there's a whole nother thing that happens even before they get here of helping to make families feel more comfortable, uh, making sure that this is the right fit for all. Um, and so that, that takes a lot um, and a lot of uh, really making sure that you're providing that support right when they enter the door, even before anybody kind of packs in to you know, start to move in. Yes, exactly, and I'm very fortunate. I have a wonderful team in my office, and every single one of them goes out of their way to make sure that they're making that family feel like you're making the right decision. They're taking time to answer their questions. Sometimes the same questions over and over. Oftentimes, we'll get family members that are disagreeing about placement, and we then become the moderator to try and assist with not necessarily convincing, mm -hmm. but with supporting and pointing out you know the reasons that we are the best choice for their family member at the time. Oftentimes, people choose not to come in, and then some time goes on and they're back because they can no longer care for their family member. Right. And so uh, your team takes people on, or the family members, on a tour of the facility. Uh, what are some of the places here that um, families get to see when they come in on a tour? So we're very fortunate to live on this, to have this beautiful campus. It's, it's kind of, easy to present it because it presents itself in many, many ways. One of the things that we showcase is our rehabilitation, uh, short-term as well as some of our long-term patients get rehab, and our services are so well-renowned that that is a really, really big part of our tours. People have a lot of questions about, you know, how much rehab are, is my loved one going to get? What types of rehab do you do? Do you go outside for rehab? The other areas that we showcase is a lot of our main floor, our yeah. art collection, our, this museum that we're, that we're sitting in, the solarium, the beautiful waterfront areas, the art studios, the, we highlight the music programs and the art programs and the numerous, numerous other things that people participated in pre-COVID. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm sure that, you know, for families, I, I'm sure that many of them may have an idea of what a nursing home looks like and when they actually come here to a place like this and be able to see our outdoor area, our museum, the artwork, um, and actually see some of the programs in the art studio taking place that may um, really help to change. I mean, I think anyone who walks in here has a change of opinion of what they think they may see in a nursing home. Absolutely. We, we, and we often get that very comment, Lydia. It, it's, I never expected this. You know, people, Really, it's not something, nursing homes aren't something that people think about really until they actually need the services of a nursing home. And for so many years, nursing homes kind of had this bad reputation of, oh, you know, I'm putting my mother away or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly not here. This nursing home exudes the fact that we're here to help these residents and patients live their best quality of life every single day. And our programming, as you say, is so extensive. There's always something to do. It's a place of joy and hope. It's, I don't find it depressing at all. And that makes it very easy to convey to the families. And I think they sense that. And the beauty that surrounds them, no matter where they are here in our facility, and the smiling faces of our staff and the experience of the staff really helps to reinforce that they are making the right decision, even though it's a difficult one. That's beautiful. Um, the, the thing that I'm kind of thinking about right now is that, um, so you start in your team, you bring everybody in and you're kind of that first connection to the home. And then after they come here, do you, how does it feel to see them kind of transitioning, maybe to engaging um, in programs or acclimating to their new environment? What is that like for you and your team? It's really very, very satisfying. It, it really is because you know, it's easy to say to someone, oh, we have this and we offer this and, and you know, this is beautiful and the food is excellent. And But until you see this person living and enjoying all that we sort of were presenting to them, and now this has become their home or going up on a floor and having the resident say, oh, come and see, I, I put the artwork in my room and doesn't it look so nice? And it's really, really a very, very good feeling. And, and again, so many thank yous and calls from family members saying, my mom or dad is so happy there. Or I went to see my best friend and she's doing great and she's well dressed and she's fed properly. And it, it's a really a rewarding, rewarding position. I can feel that from you as you talk about it too. 
Um, so how did your journey in life lead you to this career that you're in now? So it's interesting. The early part of my career was in commercial real estate management and development. I worked in New York City, and then I worked in New Jersey. Um, a relocation brought us back to New York, where I had grown up, and I was really reevaluating whether or not I wanted to continue in that corporate type of business world. And I came upon, I'm a very outdoors person, I love being outside and in nature, and I discovered the New York Botanical Gardens when I moved up here. And after numerous walks and tours and lectures, I decided to enroll in a couple of classes, and that's where I found horticultural therapy. And as part of my horticultural therapy certification, we were required to do a 180-hour internship in a healthcare facility that offered it. I was very fortunate to have gotten a position at NYU Langone Rest Rehabilitation, which is one of the country's largest horticultural therapy programs. Wow. And the 180 hours soon led to two years of working <coughs> at NYU wow. Langone, and one of the, my we worked with everybody from pediatrics to stroke patients, the, the whole gamut. Um, but I really found that I had an affinity for working with the geriatric population. And from there I worked as a memory care director, and from there I ended up here as the admissions director, which gives me the ability to combine my business background along with my huge respect for the geriatric po population and the work that we do here. Wow, that is so interesting to just kind of encounter something that you have such a passion for and then find that you have this really strong connection with the older adult population mm -hmm. and then being able to combine your two worlds together. It's been very, very rewarding and satisfying. I'm very, very blessed to be here. That's wonderful. I, I find it so interesting talking to everybody on the show and all um, hearing where people came from mm -hmm. is such an interesting thing and, and it seems like all of us have this certain thing in common is that we've really found um, that spark with the older adult population um, that really just shows how much this place is just such a special uh, home for everybody. I, I agree, I agree, and I think it's wonderful that there is a facility like this that truly lives and breathes what they put out there, that we love and respect and hold in very high esteem our older population, and they deserve that from us. Um, so, speaking of being a horticulture therapist, um, we, I know you brought some things to share with us today, which I'm so excited about. It's our first, like, real sharing demo that we have. So, I, I just brought a couple of things. One of the things that, um, obviously part of horticulture is plants and, the, and working with plants and horticultural therapy is, is essentially working with plants and nature to achieve goals. That goal can be a therapeutic goal, that goal can be a, a goal of stress relief, anxiety relief, and working and gardening in nature does that. I mean, this is just a little simple arrangement I put together with cut flowers from my garden. They're very simple. And it's, it doesn't have, you don't have yeah. to be a floral designer to make something really, really attractive. Mm -hmm. This brightens up an office if you're coming to visit your family member. It really, it takes no time to do this. It would make their day just bring this to them. The it's other beautiful. plants I brought along, this is just your basic old spider plant. You can buy it in a shop right or in a home care center. But again, the variegation of the leaves it is one of the easiest plants to take care of. Oftentimes I hear, oh, I can't grow plants. I don't have a green thumb. But just imagine this sitting on someone's windowsill. It, and it's a very forgiving plant. You forget to water it, it'll start to tell you with some little brown tips. <laughs> but it's not, it's not going to uh, pass away anytime soon. This is another very common plant. It's called a pothos. Easy, easy care, likes all kinds of light levels, but again, it just, it, it makes me smile to look at it. And it would bright, it brighten up any little corner or a nightstand, and it's very easy to trim. It grows like crazy, but literally if you were to cut here at this node, you could put that into water and regrow a whole and new, new plant. plant. Wow. Yeah. And then just something even as, as simplistic as you know, plucking a, a calla lily or a tulip and putting it in a single jar. I just think it really brightens things up. And the other beautiful thing about plants that I've found working with the geriatric population is so often they feel like they don't have control. You know, they're on a schedule and 
they're the ones that are being taken care of, and this is somebody else is giving them their medication, and somebody else is taking care of this, and somebody else is taking care of that. Having an ability to take care of a plant, believe it or not, is very, very rewarding to them. You know, they, it's something that they can nurture, they can control, they can see the rewards of it. Plants are very non-discriminating, right? It's so true. Um, we have so many residents here, I know, who have plants in their room, and just that ability to take care of something else and have that control, like you were saying, is so important. And the fact that we can provide the opportunities for anybody to have uh, an opportunity to have some greenery, have some life in their rooms, and bring them some joy is so fabulous. It is. And the, I, the, just the last thing I want to say about that is I don't want to ever underestimate the power of this greenscape that we have here. I mean, honestly, I've used the word blessed a number of times, but, but we are so fortunate. And I don't mean just the residents. This particular last few months has been very, very stressful for everyone. And if I could offer just a piece of advice, leave your cell phone on your desk or put it in your pocket and just go sit outside. Look at the beauty that is out there. It's so good for your soul. It's so good for stress relief. It's so good for anxiety relief. And it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Organizations spend hundreds and hundreds of tens of millions of dollars on rooftop gardens yeah. and therapeutic gardens and because there is benefit and reward to that. Yeah, that is and, so true. And we have it here. Right in our backyard. For free. We have land and water and it's just so beautiful to all have and the trees too. Um, I wanna ask for those of you watching that maybe uh, like myself, don't have a bit of a green thumb, what are some things to look for? I know you said with a plant like this, it'll start to turn little brown tips. Right. Um, how much should we be watering? Things like that. So the, the, the rule of thumb, no pun, no pun intended, <laughs> is that you want to feel the soil. It, the plant will tell you. Um, you want to feel the soil, and it wa you want it to be moist, but you obviously don't want it to be soggy, right? This is a, a wonderful type of pot because once you water and it starts to come through, you know that the pot, the water has gone through to the roots of the, of the plant, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. Anytime you start to see drooping, anytime you start to see withering, that's when your plant needs some attention. Okay. If you found that it's already water, perhaps it's in too bright or too less light area, in which case you can move it. As I said, these two plants happen to be amongst the most tolerant right. and can handle office light, they can handle bright light. Um, and the other thing about watering is it depends on the amount of sunlight it's getting. Obviously, if this is on a nightstand, not so close to the window, it'll stay moist for a lot longer than it will on a windowsill. Right. So I think just, you know, the kind of, you know, once a week should be enough. But okay. again, the best test is the, the thumb test in the soil. They really meant it when they said green thumb. Yeah. Using your thumb. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Um, just for all of our residents watching, don't forget that if you need any help with anything, any plants that you have in your room, um, anybody in the activities department can of course bring up soil for you and help you with your plants. We have a ton of soil in the art studio, um, so let us know. Um, and call us if you have any planting tips too. Don't forget we have the extension of 2813. Maria, do you have anything that you want to share or to our residents that are watching before we end off? So the only other thing I wanted to add, and I know that we've all experienced, but most of all, you have experienced the inability to have to quarantine, to be in your rooms and on the floors and not being able very much to get out. Um, there are some wonderful resources online. Um, Wave Hill and the New York Botanical Gardens offer virtual tours, interactive classes. So it's not only a bit of learning, but it's just, it's beautiful. The grounds right now, which, I mean, they're closed for all intents and purposes, but you honestly feel like you are there. So shut off the news and turn on the New York Botanical Garden <laughs> or the Wave Hill website for just a little food for the soul. And it really, it really is worth that time. That's wonderful. And we all want to take some of Maria's advice too. So if anybody from Project Fresh Air, that'll be Peggy or any staff volunteers on your floor, we are bringing people outside. So, you know, jump on board with us when we bring your floor down and we'll take advice and, and really enjoy our outdoors that we have right here in our backyard. Exactly. It's very beneficial. and and it'll make us all feel a little bit better about what's going on in the world. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today and bringing these plants. I loved it. Uh, I would love to come again or to do a, a demonstration for once we get opened up on floral arranging or something, just. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course.
Well, that was lovely. I've learned a little bit myself, um, too. So thank you so much, Maria, for joining us and sharing about our team and the admissions process. It was so lovely. So now for our positive news story. Um, I wanted to tie it into nature today. Across the paved streets of the UK and France, sidewalk chalk is beginning to be employed by more than just children as rebel botanists regularly break street chalking laws to write the names of wild plants and flowers growing through the cracks in the cement. Beginning in France and leading to a campaign called More Than Weeds in London, this act of highlighting the names of wild flowers and other plants has drawn significant attention on social media where images and videos are racking up hundreds of thousands of fans. Boris Presick, a botanist at the Toulouse Museum of Natural History, walks around his city chalking the names of the plants he finds on sidewalks and walls to help raise awareness of the diversity and richness of plant citizens in the heart of the southern French city. I wanted to raise awareness of the presence, knowledge, and respect of these wild plants on sidewalks. People who had never taken the time to observe these plants now tell me their view has changed. Schools have contacted me since to work with students on nature in the city. Pressick told The Guardian. In one of those, every day you break three laws you didn't know existed moments, it is illegal to use sidewalk chalk on public pavement without permission for any reason. However, no one in London, Cambridge, or Hackney seems to mind the graffiti. With one selection of identified plants posted by a London resident on Twitter, receiving over 100,000 likes, Many species of plants considered weeds, such as dandelions, which can thrive in urban environments, actually provide more pollen and human food per flower than other wilder species, according to a study, which looked at 65 plants across six UK cities. They found that weed species occupied the top five spots for <coughs> nectar sugar produced and two spots in the top 10 for pollen production. Every flower counts and will be targeted by pollinators. If we change our perceptions and see the dandelion flower for what it is, an absolute lifeline to our bees in early spring, we might learn to love them more, said UK plant life spokesperson Trevor Dines, who was speaking to The Guardian. Being able to see and identify a plant is important for a person to build an awareness or appreciation for plant life in the city. People who don't understand the name or function of a particular plant in an ecosystem like their yard are less likely to be interested in them, just as they would if they were watching a sporting event without knowing the names or roles of any of the players. Botanical chalking gives a quick blast of nature connection as the words encourage you to look up and notice the trees above you, the leaves, the bark, the insects, the sky. And that's all good for mental health, said one of the lawless, chalk-armed English botanical enthusiasts who spoke to The Guardian under conditions of anonymity in order to avoid the fines for graffiti. It's brought me a great amount of joy, they added. So there we have it, people finding ways to connect to nature. Remember to tune in to Channel 8 later today. We have Catholic services coming up at 11 or in a minute. Your Hip Parade with Larry at 1.30. Shabbat Shalom will not be taking place today. And don't forget, you can catch this episode of Good Morning Hebrew Home again on channel 88, our streaming channel, or at 6.30 on YouTube. That's our show for today. Once again, this has been Olivia Cohen with Good Morning Hebrew Home. We will see you all Monday, same time, same place, same channel. Cohen out. Oh,